Okay, great. Well, welcome everyone. We'll we'll do a call to order and um, have Mindy do a roll call to get us started. Okay. Ada Anderson. Um, Andrea Sahaka said she was going to be late. Barbara Boyer. I'm here. <laughs> uh, Bob Brocker. I think he's gone too today. Kathy Noon. Chris Lynn said he was out. Um, Connie Ward. Dave Appel. Here. Don Perez. Here. Donna Mullins. Here, but I want to say that I just had knee surgery, so I'm going to be in and out and in and out doing my walking and stretching and stuff. So just if I disappear, that's why. <laughs> okay. Ed Moss. Ed Moss. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm here and in the car driving to an event. Okay. Uh, George Teal. Gretchen Lopez. Jim Dale. Mindy, Gretchen's going to be joining late. Okay. Uh, Carrie Erickson. Here. <laughs> Perla Geller. <laughs> Bill Sernanik is out. Uh, Sean Wood. Sherry Hade Vogel. Present. Sharon Teslinger. Here. Steve Conklin. Tex Elam. I'm here. Tom Howell. Here. Valerie Robson. That's a here. Uh, Winshaw. <laughs> I'm here. All right. Um, I did notice that we have um, a couple of guests. Carol Fay. Carol, yes. Where are you from? I I'm in Littleton, and and if uh, if you restrict your um, representation, Phil Cernanic and I are from just down the street from each other, so that may be a problem. <laughs> I was uh, recruited by Fonda Buckles. Okay, well, we'll put you down as our guest today. Thank you, Rachel Walker is also a guest. Hi, good morning, everyone. It's still morning. I had a double check. <laughs> I'm Rachel from Developmental Pathways. Excited to be joining. I've joined this meeting a couple of times, but um, Developmental Pathways has gone through some pretty radical changes lately. So took a little hiatus, but excited to um, to rejoin this meeting. Okay, great. Do we yeah, have any radical other changes? Guests? Are... <laughs> Sorry. Do we have any <laughs> other guests that I haven't called on oh there's bob hi bob hi so i think that um that just leaves us with the dr cog um employees and um you can just look at those guys as in participants thank you perfect thank you do we have any public comment from any of our guests or Anything you Rachel, like? this might be a really good time for you to just jump in and tell what's going on. Sorry, caught you with your no, <laughs> it's eating. my fault. I'm like, I'm like, yeah, I'm just a little snack in. Um, yes, thank you so much, Sheila, for allowing me the space. Um, how many folks on the call have heard about case management redesign? Didn't I didn't think so. Okay, cool. <laughs> so we have a couple. The state of Colorado has redesigned the way that case management agencies, so the folks that are serving um, people with disabilities, provide case management services. They've simplified the system, so it's a fantastic um, initiative that they did. I think sometimes we're always like, oh, I don't know um, if the state is always thinking about the end user in mind, but in this case, they were, so it's pretty exciting. Um, it means that one case management agency will now provide all the disability services for a designated service area. So Developmental Pathways was awarded the contract for Arapahoe, Douglas, and Elbert counties. So that means we now uh, house all 10 Medicaid waivers, the four non-Medicaid programs, in addition to the various other um, 
state and local programming that we have available for folks with disabilities. Um, with this initiative, we are looking to start a community advisory committee. Um, so part of our work is looking for um, folks that might be self-advocates that might be on one of those Medicaid waivers or something like that, or someone in our catchment area that has a disability that would like to have their voice heard um, with developmental pathways and the work that we're doing in the community. So if that interests you at all, please uh, let me know. I'm going to pop my information in the chat so you can get a hold of me. Um, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, and please let me know if you have questions as well. Um, the reason why there's a little chuckle about all the radical changes is because we pretty much doubled in size exactly a month ago. And so our agency went um, from around 18,000 to around 16,000 now. So we, um, we've we been busy. <laughs> you have been busy. Thank you for, for joining us today. And we look forward to hearing from you, Rachel, um, on how things are going. I imagine you're taking a lot of time just to find your footing right now. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Any other public comment before we move on? <clears throat> Wonderful. Okay. Um, one thing that I wanted to mention is to just give such a shout out to Dr. Cog's staff for putting together the template that they sent to all of us so that we could be the advocates for funding. I think having something in writing from Dr. Cog professionals to help us craft our own um, email, I found really beneficial. Even though I ended up changing it, the bones were in front of it for me, and that was really helpful. So I know a few of you sent those out, and I thank you in advance. I think we all have to be a collective voice in this time of funding. The other thing that I heard recently um, on NPR is that only 13% of older Americans can afford to have help in the home one day a week. These are folks that aren't on Medicaid. These are self-pay folks, which a lot of us will fall into that category as we age. Completely unacceptable, 13%. So those are the category of folks that have to then be forced into a higher level of care, which in my mind, it just really proved how valuable the AAA funding is for the service providers that are providing that um, help in the home for older adults. It's just a win-win. So I just wanted to share that stat because I don't know about you, but 13% seems really low to me. Um, that's all I have. Jayla, if you want to jump into your report. Sure. So first, I wanted to talk about in-person meetings. Remember, we had talked about having more in-person meetings, uh, looking at uh, uh, what that takes and how we might do it. So we decided that uh, when I say we, it's Carrie and Mindy and Bob and I kind of sat down and chatted about how we were going to do this and um, decided that we were going to have uh, we're recommending that we have in-person meetings in April, June, August, and October. So for, for next year in places across the region. So, you know, kind of spread it around, making sure we got uh, opportunities to uh, see maybe some of our contractors and definitely see the communities that we're working in. Um, uh, and uh you know, we always have a backup of Dr. Cog, a uh, meeting at Dr. Cog if something doesn't work out. You heard Doug last meeting say that he would pay for parking. Woohoo! Um, so <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, 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 and so we feel, you know, that will help us have the opportunity to get together, but also uh, you all won't have to drive in the bad weather. And uh, we can, during those winter times, we can stay in and be cozy connect and then in the nicer months we can connect in person are there questions donna has a question can you repeat the dates april june april june august and october okay thank you thanks and when uh you have a question yes uh so 
uh, going from the calendar, I had made arrangements uh, or city staff did with Kiwit for January 26th. So what I'll do is I'll send her information to Mid Mindy and uh, Mindy, she needed an answer by today on that date. So if you can tell her no for that date and give her a choice of the other uh, months and dates, that would be wonderful because Kiwit um, uh, has an amazing location off of light rail. Basically you step off of the train and 20 feet further and you're in their building. So it's um, a really ideal light rail meeting spot if if any of the uh, April, June, August, or October work. So that's just, nice. Uh, that might be good for the April or October because you never know what the weather is going to be like, right? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. that would be good. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Um, Thanks, Wynn. Send that to Mindy. Okay, great. Thank you. I also wanted to tell you about, um, so Nimble, you remember Nimble, um, that's our fall uh, balance and fall prevention program, uh, our largest uh, contractor, the largest uh, uh, fall prevention program in the country. Over 27,000 people have been a part of Nimble since we started it a few years back. They had an event for us uh, a few weeks ago, the beginning of November, uh, that they called the Allies for Aging. Um, and I know Gretchen Lopez went to it. I don't know if anyone else from our advisory committee went to it, but it was a really wonderful event that highlighted our partnership um, and the importance of Older Americans Act dollars uh, as being one of those uh, and AAA services being one of those agencies that they could go to to really pilot the program and then grow the program in the region. Um, and uh, it's really becoming a strong partner in advocacy for us. Uh, but they brought a lot of folks in that wouldn't normally hear about this and are, are advocating uh, pretty aggressively. They're going to be meeting with uh, JBC staff members to talk about um, how value our, uh, valuable our partnership has been and how the funding needs to, you know, that, that the AAA network across the state needs to have, continue to have more funding to meet the valuable needs and that they, you know, they, they will talk about how we're one of the only places that could uh, grow, uh, uh, pilot and grow uh, this service across the region that they tried with lots of other partners and they just weren't able to expand as rapidly as they could with the area agency on aging. So, uh, and be able to serve so many people. So that was a really good event. Um, I, 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 if Gretchen comes on, maybe she can talk about what she thought. Um, this month I've also been working a lot with Rich on uh, JBC information. So on next week, um, the JBC will be receiving a briefing on the Area Agency on Aging request for funding. And uh, so I, uh, uh, several staff at Dr. Cog helped compile a bunch of information. Um, I wrote it up for Rich. He modified it along with our uh, lobbyist Ed and uh, JBC staff or will be using that to give a briefing to the JBC about AAAs and the services they provide and the fiscal cliff and the impact, uh, you know, what will happen um, uh, if we don't get increased funding, people will lose services. It just will happen because uh, we don't have the ability to sustain services. Um, without additional funding. We had a meeting, I had a meeting with the uh, staff from the Adams County Department of Health, which was my first time meeting with them and with the crisis management team in Adams County. And we talked about 
just kind of met each other and learned about what they do, what we do, how we could partner some of the big issues. Um, Carrie, you might be interested. They're also dealing with a, a higher um, suicide rate in older adults um, uh, in that area. And we were talking about that, definitely talking about diabetes prevention. And then this whole crisis management, seeing more um, abuse and fraud in, in Adams County than they've seen in a while. I can tell you, I also looked at our stats recently. Our abuse uh, cases are up um, pretty significantly. Um, and I, I haven't really dug into why that is, but we can definitely confirm uh, an increase in abuse reports. Um, Doug and I met with Seniors Resource Center uh, to, they, they are concerned about the fiscal cliff and what impacts it might have on their organization. Uh, they really were hoping to get an understanding of what that might look like for them. Unfortunately, we don't know, right? We don't know what it's gonna look like. I can tell you what today looks like as far as the money that we're short, but that might change. Um, uh, you know, as if we get money from the legislature, we're working on other partnerships. Uh, and so it's difficult to, and I think we've, we also met with, uh, the nutrition providers, uh, that we fund in, in the region. And they were also, I think, hoping for a little more information, like how much are you thinking we're going to be cut or, you know, what does that look like? And, and we really don't know. And I know that's difficult for our contractors because uh, they need to plan and they need to figure out what they can do um, and what they need to, you know, if they need to ask other places for additional funds. Uh, and, and we were, I think, I think, they understood, but we're frustrated that we didn't have a lot of answers for them um, because we just don't know. There are so many variables right now. We just don't know what the funding is going to look like. And we really may not know until like April, uh, which is hard um, because you're, you know, that's, that's when the JBC is going to start, you know, we'll have a way better idea of if we think we're going to get funding in the JBC process. So we still don't know if we're going to ask someone to carry a bill for us. In addition, we'll kind of make that decision by the end of December. Hey, Jayla. Uh -huh. Quick question, at least for the contractors, could we tell them if we get no funding, you'd be cut by this much, or if we get the 5 million, we'd be- The problem be is, is the funding subcommittee makes that decision, right? We don't make that decision. Well, the funding we, subcommittee we makes those recommendations. We could tell them as if it were a percentage across the board. It doesn't guarantee what any particular organization might receive or, or whatever, but I do understand they're wanting to try and at least put some kind of a stake in the ground. And, and if they need to be fundraising, this would be the time to do it. Not We've definitely not been telling them they need to fundraise because it's okay. so uncertain, right? The other thing okay. that we're going to have to decide is, you know, are we going to spread this peanut butter thin or are we going to try and hold those core services really strong and maybe not fund some of those other um, services. We have to be in compliance with the Older Americans Act and with the state policy and procedures, but there are other things that we don't necessarily have to fund um, or we don't have to fund the level at the level that we've been funding at. So all of those are really difficult decisions. And I think you all have asked me and I, I plan to do this in January, kind of, kind of go over what are those requirements? Remind us what those requirements are again. So that would be either in January, or February, just to remind you what we must do. And then, but I understand what you're saying. I just, yeah, it's hard because we're going to be down, you know, between seven and $8 million. That's not even really clear yet. 
We're waiting on money that's been stuck with CDOT because remember we got $2 million allocated for nutrition projects, um, but it's stuck in CDOT and, and um, Travis and Sharon and Ron and now Doug are working to get it released. If that gets released, that'll be very helpful, right? Um, we're also working with, I have to tell you, kind of an interesting thing happened at that allied and alliance meeting or, or alliance for aging meeting. So we're doing our thing, you know, I'm talking, Rich is talking, uh, the meeting's over, uh, the, uh, nimble, the director or the CEO of nimble comes up and says, Jayla, do you have time for a meeting? And so AJ and I go up for a meeting and Kaiser Permanente is there and Kaiser Permanente says, Hey, we're interested in funding nimble across it, you know, it's starting in Dr. Cog region and across the state. Here's what we would need to do that. And, and I'm like, what, what, what? <laughs> trying to figure out that would be wonderful. That would pull some money into, right? So we're working on that. And then they're also talking about the possibility of expanding services with Dr. Cog, Kaiser Permanente, social determinants of health, all that stuff that we've been working on, but it happened so quickly and organically, right? So that could be a piece. And that's what I think is gonna happen is we are gonna be able to pull in funding for parts of our services, right? Um, it won't be funding that will go for every service, but then that opens up the Older Americans Act dollars to serve other people. It's, <laughs> it's such a big tangled web right now, but hopefully it'll get clearer as we move along. But we will try and give our, our contractors as much information, but we are trying to be, you know, open with them and talking with them regularly about what's going on, giving them updates so they can prepare. Um, we're also going to bring some of our larger contracts together, contractors together, the CEOs from those organizations, bring them together for a meeting uh, and talk about ways that we can collaborate with legislative efforts as well as advocacy. Sharon Tessier has a question, Jayla. Hey, Sharon. Hey, Jayla. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Right. Um, has, have we looked into Prop 123 funding for services? Yeah, um, we are looking at Prop 123 for opportunities, trying to figure out what those would be. Um, do you have any ideas, I, 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 like, they have bucket of funding for services and it yeah. sounds like this would be um, right up their alley um, because it's regional. Um, so um, I don't think. Uh, yeah, it, but isn't it mainly, I, I, I don't know as much as my colleagues in Dr. Cog know, but isn't it mainly around housing and supportive well, services and housing? We, it could be, um, but we could also make the argument that, um, you know, the most vulnerable population we have um, and the highest number, highest population we have that's entering homelessness is our seniors yep. um, due to rent increases. Yep. Um, so it would be eviction prevention. It could, it could be like rent um, assistance, um, some sort of um, you know, funding to create your own program within your own municipality. I, I think it's worth taking a look at. I have yeah, I will definitely take a look at that. Um, and and do you mind maybe if I reach out to you if I need some more absolutely Please ideas? Do. Yes. Okay, great. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Uh so as you know, um uh the flyer is completed. I think we had our last meeting yesterday about the flyer. Uh, Doug has made a couple of adjustments. And so that will, that's done the toolkit um, that's providing information for you all and our contractors and community partners uh, is being developed. We're getting continuing to get really great client stories. Um, you 
probably saw the Colorado Center for Aging's action alert to the JBC. That's been really wonderful. Thank you to those who have been filling that out and sending that to the JBC and sharing with us the fact that you sent it to the JBC. Thank you so much for that. Um, I wanted to tell you, uh, this is our last month for no copay radio, no more, no copay radio. We just can't do the sponsorship. We can't um, pay for that sponsorship anymore. Um, it was a wonderful opportunity to highlight issues about older adults um, uh, and our contractors, but uh, we're just not going to be able to do that. So December is our last month with no copay. Um, there are a couple of people thinking about um, Next 50 is thinking about sponsoring it. And then also um, uh, uh, SCL Hospital Systems is thinking about, Greg Moss uh, is thinking about co uh, sponsoring it as well. Um, so we'll see if it continues. If not, it, it's going to end. And Murphy Houston says he's just going to, uh, take it easy and not, not Murphy doesn't know how to take it easy. Um, <laughs> and I don't know if Mr. Conklin is on, but I don't know if you know this, but he is now mayor Conklin. Um, he was, he is the new mayor of Edgewater. <laughs> Thank you very hey. much. I am on. No oh, problem. yay. So <laughs> congratulations to you. Thank you so much. <laughs> That's my report. That was long, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. It was a good report. Thank you. Um, let's move on to approve the consent agenda and meetings from October 27th. Is there any comments or correction on any of that? No. Okay. I would move to approve. Second. Any opposed? All right, so moved. We are now going to have Sharon come on and talk to us about additional funding. Sharon? Well, um, Sharon Day, um, AAA Business Operations Manager. Um, hope everyone's doing well. Um, this action item is related to the distribution of Federal Older Americans Act carryover funds to our AAA provider uh, group. Uh, so we, Dr. Cog received an option letter from the state allocating funds uh, unspent from the previous fiscal year to this year. And so we put it out there for our contractors to request additional funding. Um, and we received um, a large number of requests, over two thirds of our providers submitted requests uh, for, um, for services that they're already contracted for. Uh, their justifications included the additional clients and the units of services that they would provide with the um, requested funds. Um, and the funding subcommittee of the ACA uh, convened a meeting a few weeks ago to evaluate the requests. And um, they do follow a, an established process for distributing um, additional funds, which looks at sort of the, the requirements of the Older Americans Act, as Jayla alluded to earlier, what is required of us to, to fund, um, identifying where we have the, the highest level of needs, looking at wait lists and that sort of information. And they've made the recommendations on the attached um, uh, that, that uh, Mindy's got up here. Uh, so we had over $3.2 million of requests from our providers. We had approximately $1.6 million to allocate. And so um, some Services were not uh, able to be uh, uh, to be accommodated at all. Some only received uh, or were recommended for a partial allocation of what they requested. Um, but I'm happy to entertain any questions that you might have. Um, you you may note that there is one provider, Jefferson Center for Mental Health, who actually requested to de decrease their um, contracted funds, and so that is noted on there um, as a as a negative. 
at their request. Um, so happy to answer any questions that you may have. Hey, Sharon, this is Bob Rocker. Uh, just a quick question. Sure, Are there any, requir re any requirements for any of these contractors in terms of when they have to spend this additional money? Indeed, yes. Yes, thank you. Um, so they, uh, as part of their justification, they had to uh, explain their ability to spend those funds by the end of the state fiscal year. So those these funds will need to be spent by the end of June of next year. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions for Sharon? No. Again, thank you, Funding Subcommittee, for all of the time and attention that you put into these. I know it's hard. It's it's hard every time. Um, we will need to vote on it. I will abstain because my organization is is in there to receive funds. And did we decide I'm the only person that needs to abstain, Jayla and Mindy? I believe I might, Carrie, yeah. since I'm on the ARGC board. This is Valerie. Ah, that's right. So do we still, we have quorum though. But yeah, we have quorum. Okay. Well, okay, this is Bob. So I have to abstain because I'm on the a little help board. Okay. So. Do we still have quorum, Mindy? Yeah, let's see, one, two. Yes. Yes. Okay. We have 11. All right. Can we have a motion to approve the additional funding options from the funding subcommittee? I'll move. Second. second. Whoops. Any Who is the second? Tom? Yeah. Well, um, um, that's fine. Also. Yep. Any opposed? All right, so moved. Wonderful. Okay, if we could stop sharing the screen, Mindy. Yeah, yep. Okay. Let me get back to the agenda. What are we doing? <laughs> okay. We have the informational briefings for the legislative update. Rich, where is he? I haven't seen him. He is here. He was on. I am on. There he is. So, now, hi, everybody. All right. So, gee, what do you want to know that Jayla hasn't already covered? <laughs> um, everything, Rich. Everything. Yeah, really. Um, maybe just a couple of additional things on uh, aging funding. Yeah, Monday, um, if, and if anybody wants to try to listen in, um, Monday morning between 12 and noon anyway, that's currently the schedule for the Joint Budget Committee to get their staff briefing on uh, the part of the Department of Human Services budget that um, includes- Which can people go down in person? Like yeah, old days? Yeah, 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 it's in person down um, in the- uh, um, what was it state library building? I forget that that building that's across from the Capitol on on Fourteenth Avenue. Um, if you do go down, they have now installed um, the uh, um, security security check in, like they have at the Capitol. So you have to go enter through the basement, mm -hmm. and go through the security, and then like take the elevator up. To the it should be on the third floor for the JVC, um, but it but it is also and I could put the link in into the chat. Uh, um, there's also uh, it'll also be uh, broadcast or streamed uh, through the legislature's system, and so you can um, get on it that way. Um, typically, uh, the at least in previous years when they've gotten to that part of the presentation, it's been toward the end of it, uh, just the way it's lined up in the budget. Um, but it, it 
it's scheduled for the the whole section is scheduled for for a total of two hours and our piece um won't be um all of that so you wouldn't necessarily even if you came down um if you got there a little bit late i don't think you'd miss anything uh at least not in terms of that part of the budget um i also put up the link for where the documents are posted because they are supposed to post those um on uh publicly uh oftentimes uh again past practice has been they're not publicly available until the committee meeting on that piece actually convenes and then the staff puts it up so it's 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 not been practice for them to like public put put them out there you know a week or a few days before so you but it, but they will eventually be available um i think that uh i'm i'm hoping that uh, the the staff person will call out concerns and raise the issue of both immediate needs for increased funding for the triple a's and then also looking at long-term stability or sustainability for triple a funding as well um and then we're off and running we'll see what kind of uh response or, or questions that the joint budget committee members raise um they and I'll be interested to see if any of them comment about having received <laughs> emails from the public. Um, so we'll see. Uh, they will also have the opportunity to raise questions about any part of that uh, of the of the presentation, including ours. Uh, questions for the department to respond to because the department will be then scheduled and i don't have the exact date but usually it's about a week to 10 days later um the department has a hearing before the jbc so the department staff will come in with their own powerpoint and make their pitch to the jbc explaining what's in their budget request and why and then the jbc again will ask various questions uh, of the department and so that's another opportunity to see if um if this issue can get raised um yeah before i go any further win thanks um rich i had a question on, on how we would position these things one there's a budget shortfall two we're asking for some money from the state legislature we're looking for funding from other sources but even if funding it stayed flat, we couldn't serve all of the population who needs serving. So, I, you know, it's almost like I, I want to make sure that they know we're actively looking at other funding sources, but at the same time, that doesn't let them off the hook, yeah. it, you know, to be indelicate with my phrasing uh, what do you what do you think how would we position it well i i i first my first thought and and uh, maybe jayla can jump in too because we've had these kinds of conversations uh with jbc staff jbc members other legislators before um and we do generally make the point that it's not like we're only relying on state and federal funding that we do have all the particularly at dr cog have yeah. all these other efforts that we are pursuing um to to maintain or to attain funding and then also to point out that this this funding is has and however you feel comfortable saying it that this this funding is really an investment and there's a return on investment for the state is one way right. to look at it. And um, because funding in, for these services to keep people in the community are sort of like uh, preventive services, it's sort of like you can pay me now or you can pay me more later because if those people end up, um, because they're not getting 
some of the supports that they they need to to stay in, being able to live in the community, they're going to end up uh, in much more expensive care. They're going to you know, and you could go th from uh, um, an expensive uh, uh, ambulance ride to the emergency room, which is expensive, and then they're in the hospital, which is expensive, and then they get discharged to uh, rehab and expensive, and then they get discharged to a nursing home, and and then they have to spend down and go into Medicaid, and you know, there's that whole thing. But um, I think Jayla has even said at uh, how did you say I don't know Jayla if you uh, how you've said it before, but it's really. Uh, um, adequately and sustainably funding us is really a way for the state to uh, protect its funding in Medicaid or how was it you said that I thought that was a good well yeah I don't uh, sometimes you don't I have a little brilliance but I think one <laughs> of the things that we we've been trying to say especially to JBC and to Rod Bockenfeld, Bockenfeld in particular was that you know, I'm. We need to hold the core services of the AAA very strong because we are trying to market those core services to other payers, um, and he seemed to really understand that. And so I said the same thing to the JBC staff person, and um, and uh, and and trying to just say this is really important. You know, the state is a critical partner. Um, and we understand that we have to look for other funding sources, but if the state doesn't help us hold these services strong, then we're not a viable partner for many of these other um, healthcare or insurance entities. Yeah. Thank you. Um, one other thing that has come to my attention is that um, uh, Jayla just mentioned Representative Bockenfeld. He actually is ill. He's I've been diagnosed with some sort of cancer, um, and he's going through treatments. Um, and because of that, he um, is taking some time away from the joint budget committee, even after we've already talked to him, got his support. Um, so my understanding is that Representative Taggart, um, who represents, I think it's a Western Slope, uh, Mesa County area, um, is is sitting in. In the meantime, Rep Bockenfield may eventually uh, you know, come back onto the JBC. I guess that remains to be seen. So if you haven't been able to and you want to email Representative Taggart, you can do that too. Uh, but he's now the, the the House Republican member of the JBC for the time being. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I think that's that's the main update right now as as to where we are. Um, there there has been um, there have been conversations going on about. Um, and, and part of it, in terms of any other next steps, we're really just waiting to see what, what kind of tenor we get from the JBC hearing on Monday. But, um, you know, there's, there's interest out there, as Jayla mentioned, in possibly running a bill, too. And um, so it could be it could be a JBC might still be interested, but they're thinking, yeah. If we get feedback, Rich, tell me if this is likely. Yeah, we'll probably do something for you, but it's not going to be $5 million. <clears throat> if they say that to us, then we could still run a bill, right? Sure, yeah. We could do yeah. both. Or yeah. if they say, probably not going to happen, we can run a bill. Yeah, um, <laughs> for sure. And, and you know there's there there's been some talk that you know this is really a budget thing and you really got to get buy in from the JBC and and that sort of thing and that's all true um but the real the real issue is is um building in my mind is building su the broad based support in the legislature and that's something that i think a bill running a bill could do both in terms of uh getting co-sponsors to sign on 
for when the bill's introduced, but also going through the hearing process throughout the legislature, it gives all of us more opportunities and reasons to reach out to various individual legislators, legislators that are, you know, our representatives and our senators um, and so forth to really start to build more pressure on this to have it fully funded and not not partially funded. So um, we still keep here, we still keep getting responses, even fate, you know, even sympathetic responses um, that add, but you know, there just may not be enough money to do it this year. Um, the and that's why December 20th will also be an interesting uh, meeting because that's when they'll get their next revenue forecast. Uh, and that'll be those will be the numbers that'll be that they'll be looking at or targeting when they're having their discussions um, in in January and February and March, and and that's how that's where they'll be pegging the you know the numbers of of how much money they have to spend. The September forecast, the number that keeps getting th thrown around because everybody's looking for the bottom line, right? Was they were basically saying when everything's taken into account, current budget, um, manda mandated increases, and other kinds of things like that that are sort of built into the system, there would there would be about twenty three million dollars over and above last year that the state would have to spend. And so, you know, we, we were like, well, just give us our five and then you get whatever you do with the other 18, we don't care. But, um, you know, we have gotten responses basically that there's, there's no money. There's not going to be any um, money to really do any new programs or even increase existing programs. But then we've also seen, time and time again, year after year, that if the governor decides something is important enough, if the JBC or leadership decides something is important enough, miraculously, they somehow find a way to fund it. They find the money somewhere. And so I think part of our job, a big part of our job going forward is getting them to realize that this is important enough that they just have to find the money to fund it that it's just not an option. And um, so that that will also be, um, you know, context to keep in your mind about this. And, and I think um, uh, to your kind of to your question when, uh, or just including you all, Doug's gonna talk about um, advocacy uh, with the board of directors and how we might um, so all of you board members, Tom and Wynn and um, Steve, uh, how should say directors, um, how, you know, the board can also help um, in this advocacy. And we still haven't talked about, Rich, are you still thinking about CCIA and other places like that? Uh, you mean in terms of doing advocacy? Yeah. You say, you mean CCA? CCA, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and that was, um, you know, I was um, interested and, and and somewhat surprised and pleased that uh, CCA decided to send out um, an action alert in advance of the JBC hearing, and um, definitely have have gotten, you know, groups like us and and others have picked up on that, and I've had other people contact me after that action alert went out. And yeah, so, I guess I also do mean CCIA, the counties and the oh, no, city. Oh, no, well, no, CCI. CCI, CCI sorry, yeah, blending yeah, exactly. them. Here. That's why she had me all crossed up. Yeah, sorry. Um, well, I, yeah, I mean, in fact, um, um, I've, I've, I've been trying to get in contact with, with somebody from CCI on, on their lobbying staff to talk about it, to, uh, about it with them. Um, they've, they've, they're going through some staff reorganization right now. So I think they're in addition to all, everything else that's happening. Um, um, so I've got to reach out back with them, but that could also be a conversation that we have uh, at the board uh, meeting coming up. Uh, about the uh, the state associations, obviously CCI is a little bit more uh, obvious because of the Human Services Department 
departments in the counties. Um, you know, CML might still have some interest. I don't know, uh, but but certainly working through those organizations uh, is is a good option as well, Jill, for sure. And Rich, for the benefit of the group, yeah, the acronyms, acronyms <laughs> yeah. So CCI is Colorado Counties, and it's the statewide association of uh, most of the most of the counties in the state. And CML is the Colorado Municipal League that. Uh, again, is the uh, state association for all of, uh, almost all of Colorado's um, um, cities and towns. Um, and they are very influential down at the Capitol, too. When they when they lobby something, um, it's really good to have them as uh, as partners in an effort. So, it, yeah, it would be great if uh, if we we're able to get them. And that's another thing that can help, too. Um, because they they all just like Ed and Jen and I do our lobbyists and I do you know we look at every bill that gets introduced now we don't read every bill promise you that <laughs> but we look at every bill and we try to understand if this is something that's going to be of interest to us and if so then we look at it more in depth but if we if if we end up running a bill then it gives them the opportunity to uh, evaluate that bill and it gives our members who are also members of those organizations to advocate for them to support to support that bill so that's Rich, something else we can keep in mind have we done a bill before yes yes in fact What's that um i think the last time i remember we, that we did it um i'm trying to remember yeah if, if that was the last time the one i'm thinking about was um a bill that we ran after we basically did the same thing we were doing now with with uh, Governor Hickenlooper. We had done that a few times with him. And there was one time where they came back to us and said, you're asking for $4 million, but we're willing to put $2 million in the budget. Um, and so we said, okay, that's great. We really appreciate it. But we hope you won't be upset if we still go to the legislature during the session and see if we can get the other 2 million. And they said, no, that's fine, you know. So what we did was um, uh, I ended up being able to get then state representative Diane Primavera to carry the bill in the house. And um, our Senate sponsor um, was, uh, um, now I'm just blanking on her name. I've been so bad on names <laughs> these, these last few days. Um, but, um, and what we ended up getting was the, uh, other 2 million, uh, and that was the JBC got involved and said, what we'll do is we'll give you that 2 million that's in the bill as, um, it, it was older Coloradans cash fund money. Cause we wanted it all in the older all Coloradans cash fund. Cause that's in statute. Um, but they said, we'll put it, we'll put the other 2 million on the general fund line item and then um, ha have the department build it into its base for future years. So it's still like the same kind of thing. So we did end up getting the 4 million that year. Okay, thank you. Anything else, any other questions for Rich? Yeah, I, this is Bob. Um, and I'm sorry I'm not on camera, but I'm sitting in this very public place. So um, the the question I, I have two questions. One is first one is what is what is your expectation for the DHS presentation on to the JBC the first the first presentation which is going to happen on Monday. Yeah. Is it going to include that five million dollars that we've been talking about here? That that's question one. And then question two is, okay, let's say we decide that uh, it's a good idea to run a bill. Should it be for more than $5 million? I mean, to be realistic, it's not, not really the, the number that we, we really need. So $10 million? I mean, uh, just throwing it out there. So yeah. those so, are the two. Sure. So the first answer is the way I expect it to go um, – all the indications that we've gotten is that the JBC staff 
who who does who presents the briefing and says, I've gone over the governor's budget request and the department's budget request, and here's my analysis. Um that that he he that he will call this issue out and the lack of funding in the and and um make it an issue for the JBC that he thinks they should they should uh address. And um he might have changed his mind since the last time we talked to him. I don't know. Um, but but I think that's where we're headed. That so I'm I definitely have an expectation that he will raise this issue as a specific issue for the JBC to consider. So that kind of puts it out there and puts it on their their list, if you will, and also gives us more of an opportunity to build on that with with advocacy. Um, in terms of the five million, I'm sure it'll get referenced that that's been the request. Um, we've given him information that um, just what you raised that it's really a lot more than that. You know, it's kind of like people ask, "Well, why are you asking for five million?" and and the answer is, "Well, actually, the need is twenty million, but we figured if we asked for twenty million, uh." You would have laughed us out of the room. So we're just trying to be reasonable, and we're still getting pushed back just for for that. <laughs> yeah, they confirmed that they would laugh us out of the room too. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, but the other part of it is, I mean, that's a that's a really uh, a really good question, Bob. I think for us to have, um, and then have with the uh, you know the bill sponsor assuming we can get one um do we want to um ask for um a larger amount and just make the argument that hey this is what's really needed and we're not being um crazy in any way we're just saying that this is what's needed and then we'll we'll take you know the legislative process can take it from there so i think it's worth having that conversation with the potential sponsor well, and, and I seem to remember when we met in person, the $9 million number kept coming up, that that's really what we need just to be. And that's level. just in Dr. Cog region. Yeah, just right? in Dr. Cog level, it was $9 million. So I, I think Bob's point is is spot on, yeah. that if we do go that route, we up the ask. Well, and the other thing that will be interesting to see how it comes up uh at the hearing on monday and that we could put also put into a bill the you know the full request that we had in the letter to the governor had essentially three parts to it one of it was this is an immediate crisis and we need at least five million dollars right now in this budget the other part of it was and in fact this is a long-term issue as well that this isn't going this kind of of underfunding isn't going to go away anytime soon and so the state needs to take a look at how to uh how to deal with this going forward so one part of it and we can still even put this in a bill if we want one part of it was more of a jbc detail about defining that line item in this program of services under the uh, provider rate reviews that they do so that what because they look at all the different uh, programs that they have every year um, and they they assess the various different provider rates and they, they usually update or increase several of them in each budget year and that at least gets you kind of on on the on the radar for annual reviews of is the funding adequate um the other thing the other third part that we had talked about and it this would actually in require a bill anyway that in the original conception would have been a jbc companion bill to the to the budget uh that would basically require the state yeah, however the wording would be, whether it be legislative staff or the state government or whatever, to do 
I think we said five million. I've been thinking, I mean, five years, and I'm thinking lately it should be three years. But to have like a formal, in-depth review of the adequacy of state funding for these services every few years and then have reports to the JBC um, about recommendations to going forward. So we can continue to have conversations about those, but we could put those pieces into a bill as well. Hey, one other thing um, I'm remembering, but somebody brought up about the state of Ohio having a mill levy for the AAA's. Is, it, is that something that should be put on the table? Well, I think we've had the, Jail, you can jump in. I think we've had the attitude that we're willing to talk about anything. Um, but of course, mill levies are more local. So I don't know if that would, would mean um, an effort to go county by county in the region and see if there was interest either collectively or maybe one county might decide to do something, another county might not. Um, but certainly in 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 Colorado and, and in the Denver area, um, we have no levies for uh, development disabled. I think um, developmental pathways has a mill levy, I believe, as well. So it, there is precedent for it. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's exactly how Ohio built their statewide initiative was community by community. Um, started out in a couple of their communities uh, and then expanded. Yeah, you know, and so like uh, if maybe Jefferson County would look at it and Douglas County and then and then they get that started and it expands across the region and then it expanded statewide. They've been doing, their mill levy has been in existence for probably 25 years now. Um, and it is a wonderful, it ge generates um, so much funding for yeah, um, community-based services for older adults. Um, so yeah, that's that's definitely uh, something that we can consider, but it's not, that's more of a long-term, you know, something that we'll have to work on for years. I don't see it happening very quickly, but the good thing is Ed Bowditch was our, Lobbyist for Dr. Cog was a part of that, has a lot of knowledge about that process, right, Rich? Because he was. Yeah. I think developmental active. pathways is one of his clients. Yeah. And the community center board in Colorado Springs is one of his clients too. And he's he's been their lobbyist for for many years. So he knows that system pretty well. Could help us guide us in that. Um, Mindy, can you uh, mute Tom? Yeah, I'm trying to find him here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll give it over to you. So I don't know if there's are there other legislative issues you have questions about, or <laughs> are we already used up all of our time, Jill? <laughs> well, that's a mini we're, question. We're doing good on time, but okay. um, are I think thank you, Rich. Are there any other questions though for Rich before we move on? No. Okay. Well. We are doing really well on time. Um, how about Dr. Cog board report? How about if we hear from Mayor Conklin first? <laughs> Thank you very much. So I'm trying to get my camera back on. There we go. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Cog, it, it, it's been an interesting month. Uh, at our work session in November, we had the governor's legislative staff, some of the folks from the, the governor's office, come and, well, it was virtual, but talk to us about the housing bill or bills that they are looking at, at introducing this session. Uh, you remember we talked about last session 213, the, the, the things that were aimed at, at creating more housing opportunities and kind of our thoughts on that. Uh, they did not really involve Dr. Cog, CML, Colorado Municipal League, uh, other groups, and they seem to be doing a better job with that. So the hope is this session there may be a little bit better communication about those type of issues. But we were we were excited to have a work session with them talking about exciting the past. OK. 
Can you all hear him? Because I can't. Uh, traffic, traffic congestion. Uh, the, the, the crash I'll mention, because there are some aging issues that tie into that. Uh, people that are 65 or over are 52% more likely than 20 to 43-year-olds or 45-year-olds to be involved in fatal or very serious crashes. And I think we all know that, probably. But Hearing that number and seeing that in the, the, the reporting was, was really interesting. Likewise, with speed, in a 35-mile-an-hour zone, it is twice as likely that a pedestrian accident will be fatal or very serious than in, in you know, a 20, uh, than other, other uh, slower areas. So that was interesting getting that information. The traffic congestion, uh, a lot of that information was pre-pandemic, uh, but... Um, you know, it, it, it's interesting that traffic is is still not back to the normal that it was, uh, but it, it, it just was really interesting seeing what those those uh, uh, impacts are on the metro area. And then we also got an update on the land use and transportation connection technical assistant plan, which is a lot of detail there. But uh, just a, an interesting meeting. The biggest thing for me, though, is the the hopefully open up communication with the governor's office as we've talked. Housing is absolutely, and, and even earlier in this meeting, talked about security of housing, people having a place to live, affordability. You know, all of those things are pretty vital. And, and, and it's it's great that Dr. Cog is a part of that conversation. That's all I've got. Wynn or Tom, do you have more? I don't really have anything more, uh, except we did elect a nominating committee Thank you. Uh, to uh, help us bring more, um, find good candidates to join the executive committee. Um, as I, I believe we uh, selected uh, Director Nicole Spear from Boulder, uh, Jeslyn Sherazai from Lakewood and John Dyack from Parker as those representatives. And, uh, and so we'll Steve, see. Oh, also, Stephen, Stephen, also Stephen Barr from Littleton. Oh, Stephen Barr. Somehow I missed him. Oh, nope. right. I forgot. Um, <laughs> thanks. And um, so they will be able to help select from those who uh, volunteer volunteer to serve on the executive committee. Um, as Mayor Conklin rolls off, I will roll into the board chair position. And so we'll have an opening. And I see Jim Dale anxiously raising his hand. <laughs> Go ahead, Jim. It, it relates to what Steve was talking about. Uh, in Golden, the council has decided that 20 is plenty. And so it's 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 an interesting effort. Maybe it'll slow them down to 30, but on <laughs> on most all the sh streets except for the main thoroughfires, the speed limit is 20. And actually they bought a new uh, camera, a radar vehicle to uh, be monitoring this. And so I really appreciated the mayor's, I like saying that, Steve, the mayor's <laughs> comments. So um, that's my pop-up, you know, thanks, Wynn, for being so kind. And congratulations, as you ascend, to my old favorite place, the Dr. Cog. Thank you. <laughs> thanks, Jim. Okay, Tom, did you have anything you wanted to share? I think he had said no, okay. Can I just add something really quickly? I think we're really lucky to have um, all, all the uh, board representatives that come to the Aging Advisory Committee because uh, those a lot of the discussions never even talk about older adults unless we bring them up. You know, there's a lot about housing. They talk about housing and housing and housing and workforce, and but they don't talk about older adults. And so. You know, what I've noticed in our board members and our staff, they bring it up, you know, and that's and that's what we're just going to have to continue to do because folks are just not used to the fact that 
our, that we have so many older adults already. So we have more older adults now than we do under, you know, 18 in the state of Colorado. Um, and that trend's going to continue. And so everything that we do going forward needs to have some kind of an aging lens. And that's so, so, so very important um, to constantly bring up to folks. Agreed. Absolutely. Let's move on to the county reports. What's going on in the counties? I'll, um, I will, uh, I, I know that Adams County Aging Network uh, hosted a resource fair at the Community Connections and um, it was extremely successful. So oh. I think they're going to continue to do some of these smaller resource fairs and maybe spread them out throughout the county, which I think is a, a really um, good idea. More people can get involved if they don't have to travel so far. The other thing I wanted to say, I sat in on the contractor training for funding, and I want to um, say a huge thank you to Travis Noon, who put on an outstanding program. I was very impressed. And so um, uh, we will continue to move forward, but it was nice to know how that all uh fit in together now since COVID's over because it was different when we all were meeting in per person. So um, I was very pleased to see all the folks that attended and um, uh, really was an interesting um, hour and a half. So thought I'd share that with you. <laughs> That's Thank great. you. I'm Thank glad you for you attending. Did. And also a uh, shout out to Travis for um having the link available the staff our staff member that was signed up to go got really sick and now mm -hmm. she's got that link and so just working through different ways to reach people i we all appreciate it we're going to have a little bit of a challenge because the software program has changed so um, that's going to be interesting, but certainly once everybody gets used to it, I think it will be really a valuable tool. So wonderful. Thank you, Dawn. You bet. Any other county reports? It's quiet in the counties. Okay. Well, let's go on to other matters by members. Does anyone have anything they'd like to bring up for discussion or to share? Uh, this is Sharon with uh, the city and county of Broomfield. Um, I just wanted to let you all know that Broomfield last year put in um, a program it's a, it was in preparation for this year surrounding property taxes where we are working with, um, it's a partial property tax rebate program where we pay up to $1,000 of the delta that was between last year's property tax and this year's properties tax, specifically to keep seniors, um, our aging adults aging in place, um, and there is a possibility that program might expand, but um, it is exclusive to Grimfield residents um, and it has been successful so far. Um, and you can add it to the Homestead Act. Uh, you can stack, um, there's no penalty or whatever, um, but we anticipate, um, and it's for seniors uh, 65 and older for um, at the 60% AMI. Um, and we expect to help about 1500 households uh, for that because it's it's seniors, uh, people with disability, one hundred percent documented disability, and veterans at eighty percent documented disabilities. Um, so we're really looking forward to that program um, launching. And if any other community wanted to do something um, while we're waiting for the state, uh, I think it's uh, any you know we we're happy to share our program. The other thing is um, we have extend, extended our TIBRA program 
to include seniors for the next two years. Uh, we're using our home funds um, to work specifically with seniors who are severely cost burdened. And we expect to help another uh, 300 to 400 seniors in Broomfield that are severely cost burdened. Um, so we are very senior centric here. We love our seniors. We recognize um, that. And we're, uh, you know, I think Broomfield's senior population will be the highest um, in, in, in the region uh, with our uh, for Broomfield, for this area. So um, we're doing our best to create as many programs as we can uh, and uh, are available, you know, for questions from other communities. Thank you, Sharon. Anything else? I, I have one other update. Um, and it's about Kathy Noon. Um, Kathy shared with us yesterday that she is now on hospice at home. Uh, wanted to let you all know that. I didn't know if she was going to join the meeting today, but um, you know she was at our meeting yesterday, giving advice and counsel to us. Um, and what an amazing person! She looks frail. Um, she's hanging on, but boy, contributing until the last days, you know? What an amazing woman. We're so blessed to have had the opportunity to work with her. She's been on the advisory committee on aging for 17 years. And um, that's just, we're so lucky to have had the opportunity to work with her and learn from her. And man, the improvements that she's been able to do all across in her community, in, in, in um, Centennial, but also in the region and in the state have been amazing. This so I just want to give you that update. That's, uh, I, that statement uh, is absolutely accurate. It's, it's, it's astonishing. And, uh, and, uh, the continuing <laughs> effort in these very weak, weak later days. It's amazing. Yeah, absolutely amazing. Kathy has been a beacon of light for a lot of people through the years. And I, I couldn't agree with you more, Jayla and Tex. And um, I know we're all going to be sending special prayers, and heart messages to her and her family. Thank you for sharing that, Jayla. Okay. Well, I hope somebody has something positive after that before I let you all go. That That's a hard one. I think we're all feeling really tender about Kathy. And, and also how much I think coming together every every month and working on these important issues together, you really form a bond with, with the group and having a loss um, that we know is inevitable. It, it really does hit home. Um, so we are going to end um, much early today. We're really on a, um, a good time slot. I hope you all have wonderful, loved, filled holidays and we will see you after the first of the year okay. thank you everyone have a wonderful holiday thanks bye-bye thanks carrie thanks Jayla. thanks everybody happy holidays to everyone bye